Uh, good evening, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Harish. Um, I'm here to talk about Pelias. It's an open source geocoder built with Elasticsearch and Node.js. I work for Mapsin. Uh, Mapsin is a, 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 is a mapping st uh, startup which does open source and works only on open data. We don't save any kind of proprietary data or anything. Um, so let's begin with what geocoding actually is. Um, for those of you who don't know what geocoding is, it's a process of transforming input text, such as address or name of a place uh, or a neighborhood, to an actual location on Earth's surface for the lat, lat and long. It's a thing you do when you search for a place on a map. Um, here's a, I don't know if you, can, if you guys can see this, uh, searching for Statue of Liberty and then finding it. That's the act of searching, uh, con con converting a textual address into a lat long is what geocoding is. It's at least what's the forward geocoding is. Uh, and a reverse geocoding is the exact opposite, which translates a lat long into a textual address. So when you geotag your photo or your tweet or check into a restaurant, you, you basically are ge reverse geocoding. Um, when your device sends a lat long to a server and then gets back what neighborhoods you're in, uh, that is also one kind of reverse geocoding. OK, so why is geocoding so important? Well. Um, Without geocoders, it'll be hard to find places on the map. Um, it's, geocoding is, is useful for visualiz visualization, uh, for mapping locations where events of interest occur. For instance, if you, uh, you want to map uh, you know, the routes taken by uh, Prince of Wales, for instance, or the wedding procession of your friend, uh, these kind of things include mapping locations, uh, and also for disaster relief, if you want to map um, all the areas that was affected by a flood, um, you want you, sh you should be able to um, easily be, ab be able to communicate uh, what you're talking about about an address and not lat longs. Uh, searching for an address, um, specifically using uh, any kind of mapping applications that uses routing, uh, uses geocoding extensively, um, and then. Of course, reverse geocoders are something which is crucial, knowing where you are, if you're in a strange country, or if you're in a foreign country, uh, and you're trying to communicate with other people, you can't just say, I'm at you know, minus 121.7, 62.3, no, no one talks like that. So you need to know, where, you know what neighborhood you're in, and that's where reverse geocoding comes into, comes into play, and it's useful. All right, so let's, let's quickly go over the state of open source geocoders. Um, it's actually a great time for open source geocoders. As Rahul uh, spoke earlier about two fishes, there's a lot of good work being done. Uh, it's gaining momentum. Um, Nominatum is another open source geocoder that works with OSM. Most of the geocoders are tied to a certain data set or a certain type of data set. Um, not all of them are data agnostic. When I say data agnostic, I'm talking about being able to plug in any kind of geospatial data. Uh, when I say geospatial data, I'm talking about uh, rows of data which has lat and long and a name associated to it, uh, and be able to geocode on it. Um, not all of them can support autocomplete, uh, which, is, which is getting to a point where it's, it's almost necessary these days for the geocoder because people uh, I can't remember the last time I was typing to look for an address and actually use the magnifying glass button uh, that you find on the keyboard. I generally start typing and then pause for a second to let the geocoder figure out what I'm thinking about. Uh, and that's probably something that everyone assumes that a geocoder should do, and I think it's, it's nice to have. Um, Autocomplete is tricky though because you hit the service upon every keystroke, uh, so you need you need a service that can handle that kind of load. Um, and of course, uh, lastly but not least, it all of these geo open source geocoders, somewhere or the other, are de heavily dependent on external dependencies, and it's not it's not an easy process to build and install locally. Um, so as a product, uh, open source geocoders are getting there, but there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, Geocoding is, is an art and a science, according to me. Um, I come from, I don't come from a geo background. I'm in this, in this community for the last a year, year and a half, maybe. Uh, but prior to that, I'm, I'm a software engineer. I look at a problem and I try to solve it. With geocoders, I was having a conversation with Rahul earlier about the, the 
biggest problem or biggest hurdle that I faced was there's no real documentation on how to write a good geocoder. And most of the good geocoders that's out there are dictated by business requirements. Or if your company needs a geocoder, they define how a geocoder should work. But there's, there's no real spec that's out there. Maybe we should come together and document or maybe write one. Um, but oftentimes, data users are not well versed in the complexities of the software and data essential to produce the best quality geocoder for their business needs. Here are some things to consider, according to me. Uh, first, you need to identify what kind of geocoder you're building uh, or what kind of geocoder you need. There's Coast Geocoder, which does, um, which is what Two Fishes is, is uh, which is a, which is neighborhoods, cities, countries, and various different admin levels. It's not granular in it that you can't really search for a street address. You can search for a neighborhood. That's a coarse geocoder. If that's all you want, then that's your use case. Uh, if you, if you want to be able to search for street addresses, like one main street in New York, or if you want to do street intersections even, or anything that's got to do with street level address geocoding, then you're looking at an address geocoder, which uh, you, know, you might you might want to use OSM, for instance, as a data source if you want to build a geocoder on top of that. Uh, then there's POI, um, POI, which is point of interest. So if you if you want to search for restaurants and bars and uh, you know museums or parks, even bridges, and that's the only thing that you're looking for. So one of the use cases is maybe you're building a travel site and you only want to search for airports, right? So this this way you, your geocoder is only a point of interest geocoder. Uh, then there is the global gazetteer, which is all things combined. This is where things get complicated because it's not only is, the, is it it's big data, but it also combines different ways of solving. There's different search logics uh, that goes into course address and POI, but when it comes to global, you need to add another sort of like intermediary logic to figure out what the search query is. If the search query is an address, a street address, or maybe a neighborhood, or maybe a country, and then based on that, you, you rank your results differently. Um, we'll talk about each one of them as we go along. Um, you also need to know about your data. Uh, what kind of addresses do you have? Uh, if you're using a data set like OSM, you readily know that you have street addresses, but you also have points of interest, and there's all kinds of other things that come with it. And so there's nodes and ways, polygons. So you got to know what you're doing with that kind of data. So it's, it's important to know your data. If you're using GeoNames, for instance, uh, you, have, you have about 9 million points, and most of them are points of interest. Um, so knowing what your address have is, is important so you can extract the right things that you need out of it. You need to know if it's consistent, meaning that uh, for two identical points from different sources, uh, do they share the same lat long? Um, or you know, if Golden Gate Bridge, you know, in one data source has a different lat long than the other, then you've got to somehow standardize that data within your geocoder because when someone searches for Golden Gate Bridge, you can't show them two different points. Uh, so things like that need to be you need to keep in mind. Uh, then there are issues like there's missing parts of addresses. Uh, you know, for for instance. You might, have a, you might have a point that doesn't have neighborhood or city information, but only has a name and a lat long. How do you say that you're, how do you say that's, it's, you know, it's complete, it's not complete, right? So you gotta, you gotta make sure that you, for every point you have all the admin levels uh, consistent across your data. Um, so there's a way of doing that, and we'll talk about that as well. There's a, there's a quick lookup that you make for every lat long, and then, you do a co quick course geocoding and then slap all the uh, neighborhood and city and uh, country data to it. Um, complete consistent data often makes for a better geocoder. Um, it's, it's true when, when you think about a good geocoder, it's, you gotta have you know, quality, good quality data and if, if you don't, then your geocoder suffers and this, you, can do, you can only do so much with with search logic and ranking and boosting, but if your core data is incomplete or inconsistent, then it's, it's gonna be a tough job. Um, knowing your geocoder, knowing your software, does it standardize data? So what, it, what does your geocoder do when it, when it finds incomplete or inconsistent data? Does it standardize it? That's one question you need to ask yourself when building a, or when using a geocoder or building a geocoder. Uh, how relevant and accurate is it? Um, 
and what kind of search logic does it use, and lastly, is it fast and secure? So that brings me to Pelius, which is the project that I've been working on for over a year now. Um, it's, it's built on Elasticsearch and Node.js, as the talk title suggests. Uh, it's completely open source. Um, currently, Pelius is a product and a service. Uh, it's a product in it that you can set up your own geocoder based on your custom data set. Um, it is a service soon. Uh, if you want to use a geocoder for your app and don't want to set, set one up for yourself. Um, Installing it locally uh, is, is easy. I would like to say it's easy, uh, but we'll go over that quick. Um, it supports fast autocomplete. Um, this it comes for free from Elasticsearch, um, and it's quite good, I would say, if not great. Uh, there are a few bugs that I will go over that Elasticsearch needs to fix, which will make, make Pelius better. Uh, it's modular, and I can't emphasize this enough, but it's, it's gotten so modular that I have I decided to you know, talk mostly about how many modules we have and what each one does. Um, and it's easy to install and request no external dependencies. So the, so the architecture, like I said, um, Elastic Search, we chose Elasticsearch because it made sense because it's a schema-free, document-oriented data store. And the reason that makes sense is because we don't know, we didn't build Pelius for a specific data set. We want to be data agnostic. And we don't really know what kind of information a data set could have. Some might have population information. Some might have popularity. Some might have street intersections. Some might not. Um, so depending on what you want to store in Elasticsearch and what you want to search for, we made it so we, we, Elasticsearch gives us the flexibility to make it, uh, make it so that we can, we can uh, throw any kind of documents at it. Uh, it's the Elasticsearch design for horizontal scale, which is great because if you're building a, a global geocoder, um, you you often run into scaling issues, and Elasticsearch kind of automatically takes care of it. All the nodes and shards, duplications and replicas, and all of that comes out of the box. Uh, full text capabilities is something that Elasticsearch is good for. It's based is it's built on Lucene, and Lucene, as you all know, is 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 really, really fast when it comes to text-based search. Um, autocomplete, also something that comes with Elasticsearch. Now that they added geo capabilities, it's, it's gotten better. It's not just autocomplete on text. You can also have geo bias associated with it. Things like uh, if you're searching for flat iron and you type F and FLA and you're around New York City, it automatically fills it to flat iron because not only does flat iron complete FLA, uh, but also that it knows where you are, and Flatiron is the closest uh, thing that matches to what you're trying to type. Um, so we use something called the completion suggester um, in, in Elasticsearch, and it, this is something that's stored in memory at index time. So since it's stored in memory, uh, you, you know you can theoretically hit it with a large load, and it should still perform fine because everything's memory. There's no real lookup. Um, and then we use no, we use Node.js and a bit of a history about Pelius. Uh, if if you were if you listen to Randy, who is who wrote the first version of Pelius, he wrote it in Ruby and he spoke about it in State of the Map uh, in DC last year. And we moved away from Ruby and rewrote some of it, rewrote most of it in Node.js. And here's why: um, it it with Node.js, it was easy uh, to make it more modular because we used something called the streams, uh, which, which are like Unix pipes. They handle reading and writing to relatively slow interfaces and provide a nice abstraction. Uh, streams and nodes are one of those rare occasions when, when doing something the fast way is actually easier. Um, and not only that, we thought Node.js uh, has, you know, for community outreach was, uh, was we felt like it was easy to reach out and ask the community to could collaborate with us because writing JavaScript is fairly, the entry to barrier to writing JavaScript is fairly low. Um, all right, so like I said, uh, Elasticsearch, document-oriented data store. Here's how a document would look like. Um, so every point is one document in Elasticsearch. And I don't know if you guys can see this. Uh, in the back, can you guys see? Okay, you can see it. All right, so this document is is for Mission Dolores Park in Mission District. 
I had to change it because I'm in San Francisco. I was like, let's do Mission Dolores. Right? Um, so this comes from awesome, um, awesome, it's an awesome way. So as you can see, there's a name, there's a default name, Mission Dolores Park, and then there's an alternative name called Dolores Park. And if you look it up in OSM, you would see both of these names. Uh, and it's also got the zip code, a uh, lat long, which is crucial. All, all of these documents would, should have a lat long. Um, and then there's these information, which is also important. There's, you know, which country, you know, United States, California, San Francisco, and neighborhood, which is Mission District. Um, this forms the document uh, per point. And you can also see there's a suggest key over here, which is basically telling Elasticsearch that if someone starts typing mission, then suggest mission Dolores Park. Or if someone starts typing Dolores, then they're probably thinking of Dolores Park. So that's the way we index every point. So far, any questions? OK. Um, all right. So this is kind of like the high level picture of what Billius data uh, architecture looks like. Um, every geocoder has two main components, a way to put data into the data store and a way to retrieve it out smartly. Um, and so now you can see in this picture that there's the three data sets that's mentioned. Each of these data sets have to implement or use the input pipeline to make sure that the data is standardized and complete. And then eventually, after through the input pipeline, it goes into Elasticsearch. And then we have, we have a Pelias API that does some sort of ranking and boosting, which we'll talk about, and how to retrieve that information from Elasticsearch smartly. And then there's a bunch of clients. There's a mobile app, a Pelias demo, what have you, can use that service uh, from there on. At Mapsen, we are actively developing importers uh, for some of these data sets. OpenStreetMap, um, actually, yeah. So these are some of the open data sets um, that Mapsen is currently uh, working on, or I'm working on uh, in, you know, making the Pelias importers. Each of these importers use Pelias' import pipeline module. So writing an importer is fairly easy, because you only have to implement a way to extract data from the data set. If it's a CSV, then you need to figure out how to get the relevant parts of the data set, out, relevant part of the data set out of, the, out of your document. And then once you have it, you run it through a bunch of modules using streams, and it's it's easy, and I'll tell you how. Um, so some of the data sets we use, uh, OpenStreetMap has street addresses, POIs, polygons, like I said. Open addresses is an aggregation of normalized municipal address data sets. That's, it's fairly new, and we're really excited about that project and how it's going and shaping up. We also use quarter shapes. Uh, we use quarter shapes for our hierarchy information. Um, so if, if a point comes in and has no, has no neighborhood information at, attached to it, then we look up, we kind of reverse geocode using some in-memory R trees, uh, and, then, and, then fin and then complete that document. Good thing about quarter shapes is that uh, it's got four square check-in information and some Flickr, inf Flickr data information as well, which we use at the, t at the stage of ranking. Uh, I'll talk about it when the time comes. GeoNames has around 9 million POIs as population count, 2 million just in the United States. It's a, great, it's a good data set that we also use. And these are the importers that's out there. And these are, you would see the GitHub links all over my presentation. And that's because I, I want you guys to go and check it out and then comment on it, discuss, uh, code review even. Um, Anyway, where was I? Right, so uh, we, have a, we have a bunch of data sets. Uh, we have a bunch of Pelias importers. And the reason we were able to write these things fairly quickly is because Pelias is modular. Um, and here, this is sort of like a detailed look at the import pipeline. Um, I don't know if everyone can see this, because each of those um, importers that I spoke about implements the import pipeline, which is, which is there's a Pelias model, uh, a Pelias model, and then a deduper, a hierarchy lookup, and a suggester pipeline, and finally to the DB client, which talks to Elasticsearch. And this is kind of like how the data would flow. This, I'm absolutely sure no one can see this. But uh, it's the same thing. I'm just, I just put it in a different way, color, made it colorful so you all can enjoy it. But um, 
So using Node.js streams, it's easy to pipe data through various modules before going into Elasticsearch. All right, so let's get into the import pipeline itself. Um, first, you need to create an Elasticsearch index, uh, which, is, which is basically a, like a table. Think of Elasticsearch index as a table in a, in a traditional database, and all your documents go in that one particular index. Uh, it contains all the required mappings that uh, Elasticsearch expects you to create. Um, along with settings such as number of shards, replicas, kind of analysis you want to perform on various fields, like synonym expansion, for instance. Um, so you can specify all that in this uh, module or this project or this NPM module called Pelia Schema, where you know you could you could have a synonyms file which says that if you encounter ST in, in the address name, then expand it to street or STA to station, or if STA precedes marks or some other word, then expand it to saint. Um, things like that can be done here. And it's already, the project already takes care of it, but you can obviously go in there, fork it, and then change it yourself if need be. Um, then once, once you create your index, you run your data through data model, uh, which is which is a convenient way of modeling POIs and admin records. Uh, this module deals with creating a document for the given point. It has nice setters and getters uh, to neatly add name, lat long, and any other additional information to the document. Um, the only thing I can talk about uh, Pelias model is that it's evolving. We still, we, we still keep adding different uh, uh, columns and keys to it. Recently, we added a thing called popularity or a pop score, which we calculate at index time, which is useful when you're, when you're searching for something and your score is based on a pop score of the document itself. Um, I'll get to that. Then there's address deduplicator. This is a big one. Um, if we use more than one data set, which we often do, um, since now we are using OpenStreetMap and GeoNames, um, Oftentimes, you'll run into duplicates. Yankee Stadium, for instance, appears in OSM and GeoNames, um, and maybe in, in open addresses as well. So you can't have, three, like I said, you can't have three different documents for the same point. So this module deals with consolidating duplicates and adding any additional information from other sources as a meta tag into the original document. So all the alternate names would actually go into nicely in one document as alternate names. So you can search on any one of them, and it shows up that document. Um, this is again an NPM module. Uh, please check it out. Uh, there's, there's active discussions on it too, so it'd be good for you to do that. Anyway, so th then there is the hierarchy lookup, um, which is, I think it's pretty self explanatory. Uh, this module ensures that your data is complete by looking up the given point and sort of reverse geocoding and assigning neighborhood, state, country values. Uh, if they're missing, that is. If they're complete, then it just passes right through to the next module, which is the suggestor pipeline. Uh, since we have, since we use the suggestor for autocomplete that Elasticsearch produces or has, this module builds the payload. Um, it's just telling Elasticsearch that when a user starts typing any of the input listed, um, it refers to the given point in the document. So Finally, after that's done, uh, it goes to the DB client, which is, um, which is the Elasticsearch client that talks to Elasticsearch itself. So you, it's responsible to put all, the mess, all the, put the all the massage data into Elasticsearch in bulk and in parallel. So if you're running it on like four core mesh machine, it uses, it parallelizes the whole thing. Um, so one thing about the import pipeline is all of this happens using Node.js as streams. So it's not just one point at a time. It just like, it throws, it's a stream of points. So this whole process is kind of fast and it's really neat uh, to do it this way. Um, and building also, GeoNames is about 9 million points and running through an importer like this for an entire planet takes around two hours, which is, which is not bad at all. Uh, however, we are still working on the open street map uh, importer, which, which takes around, I want to say, five days uh, for the entire planet. Uh, but we're working on making it faster by using Golang parsers, and we're playing with C, C parsers as well. So you can join the conversation at 
at the at the repo. Um, anyway, so that brings us. So now that we have the data in Elasticsearch, how do we get it out, and how do we get it out in a way in a smart way? Um, we have some search logic, um, like Rahul mentioned. This is the static and the dynamic version of things. No, but we don't use any search logic that's dependent on the data set because we want to make our search logic to be as generic as possible because we're working with a geocoder that is technically data agnostic, so we don't really know what, what flags or what metrics we would, would, the data set would come with. But if the data set has these metrics, then it would, it would rank things differently. For instance, if the data set has population information, so if you search for Portland, Portland, Oregon would be, would be ranked higher than Portland, Maine, only because Portland, Oregon, there's more people there and it's, you know, more, po I guess it's more popular, right? Uh, popularity also, um, which we use uh, Quattro Shapes uh, Flickr information, which is basically in how many, picture, how many images have been geotagged to that particular lat long. And uh, once we know that Times Square New York has too many people or many people clicking pictures there as opposed to Times Square South Dakota. So if you search for Times Square around the world, we rate Times Square as the number one result. Uh, then based on population and popularity, we, we compute a pop score for the admin areas. Um, and then we, we kind of trickle it down to the street level addresses. So if you search for one, two, three main street around the world, it would suggest one to three Main Street from a popular city higher than a less popular city, for instance. And there are ways to turn this off if you don't think this makes sense for you in your case. Uh, but these are like the default behavior of the search logic. Then you have, of course, you have the dynamic ranking, which is geo bias. So if you, along with your query, if you also say, hey, I'm in New York and I'm searching for Soho, then it would, it would show Soho in New York. Uh, all, you know, higher than Soho London, for instance. But if you don't mention your lat long, uh, then Soho London shows up first because Soho London is more popular than Soho New York, according to the numbers. Um, then boosting certain values. Um, if you search for China, then China as a country should appear. Uh, if there's no geo bias, then Chinatown from New York City, for instance. Um, then there's a bunch of API endpoints. The search suggests um, reverse and doc. Search does a full text search, suggests it's used for autocomplete, uh, and then reverse does the reverse geocoding, and then doc is just a document lookup. When you provide an ID, you just get the whole document back. Uh, then we, we added, experimentally, we added course endpoints as well. So if you want to use your geocoder as a course geocoder, then this will search only those admin layers and not the street addresses, for instance. Um, then there's a bunch of parameters that you can pass. Input, which is the actual query, that's the only mandatory um, field. Everything else is optional. But if you do provide lat long, a bonding box, things like that, your search is bound to get better because now we have context. Now we know where you are and what you might be searching for. Otherwise, we'll search the entire planet and results might not be that great. So all the documentation is under Pelius slash API um, in the wiki for you to check it out. I'm going to skip through this. This is just uh, all our queries are in a different module, and um, information is there. Um, we, we didn't want to convolute our APIs with all the queries and everything floating around, so we ripped all of them apart and put it in its own thing. Um, finally, you can also customize the output address. So for instance, if you search for um, an, an address uh, in London uh, as opposed to an address in America, there's certain subtleties in the way the address is actually written out with uh, where the pin code appears, for instance. Um, so you can, you can provide a local and a regional way of saying, hey, you know, like say the country name first and then the pin code as opposed to state and pin code and followed by the country, for instance. So you could do things like that as well. Um, and of course, there's, there's, the, there's a link uh, of the file where you can go and do that. And let's say you say, uh, let's say you want to just build a local geocoder, but don't want to deal but deal with all of these import pipeline and all of that stuff. So how do you do that? We did write an automated way of doing it. Uh, there's a chef uh, cookbook um, that uh, one of one of my coworkers, uh, Grant, has written. Uh, if you go to github.com slash pelius slash vagrant, um, you, all the steps are pretty straightforward. There's only one command that sets up an entire geocoder if you point it to the right data set that you're using. 
uh, and if we happen to have an importer that uses that data set. There's a blog post about it, about how to do it. There's a tutorial as well. Check it out. Um, here's github.com slash Pellius. This is where everything happens. There's about 40 repositories. Uh, I think I spoke about at least 15 of them today. Uh, please collaborate with us. We would love to work with you. If you have a unique data set and write a Pellius importer or tell us how about, the, about the data set and we'll help you write one. Uh, open an issue, contribute on an existing issue, discuss on topics like street intersections, natural language processing, uh, review our code, comment our pull request. Uh, all the main stories and issues are opened here, which is github.com slash Pellius Pellius. Uh, get involved, join the conversation. Um, there's, there's only one way we can actually build an open source geocoder if the open source community lends a hand and actively takes part in it. That's my talk. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes. Oh, when you, uh, so the question was, uh, are we returning just the lat long or lat long and a bonding box? Is that? Uh, yeah, yeah. So when you search for a point with the geocoder, we return the name, uh, all the hierarchies, lat long and a bonding box as well. So if, if you search for pizza or pizza hut in, in, a, in a region and there's 10 pizza huts, you would get a bonding box that encompasses all the points. Uh, and then also for individual points, it comes back as a GeoJSON file. Uh, it's a bunch of features as of it comes out, comes back as. And uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Sort of. Uh, what if you're, you're uh, geocoding to administrative boundaries? Are you returning any sort of uncertainty values that indicate the size of the admin boundary? No, no, we're not. Uh, at this point, we're only returning points, but it, we, could, we could return the boundary information as well. Um, there's, a, there's a way to do that. Open an issue. We'll, we'll get it done. <laughs> yes. Yes, there is, a, there is a repo called Pellius slash demo, where there's a bunch of demos that's been written experimentally, of course. Uh, you can have a look at it. Um, but there's, there's one client um, which, which talks to the API service. And um, you could do different things, as in you can send lat long, so you can send a bonding box, or you can not send any information other than the search query, and then see the results differ with each of them. So that's pretty cool. I encourage you to write one. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm sorry? I can't. Oh, fuzzy search. Yes, yeah, so the question was what about fuzzy matching or fuzzy search? We actually have a fuzzy matching and fuzzy search. I couldn't cover it here, but the autocomplete takes care of it. So if there's a Levenstein distance of one or two based on the string length, it, it kind of does it for you. So if you, if you type mission district with one less s, it'll get you mission district. Any other questions? All right, great. So uh, evaluate this session. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, yeah. Thank you.